Good night. I'm not going to be able to sleep very well. I'm worried about Rosie. She is home. But I think that um, I'd like you all to pray for Rosie to receive the faith in Jesus Christ. I'm very concerned about her. When I left, she was happy as anything. I was there with her a very long time, learning everything I could about her health. And I think that she needs to prepare to meet the Lord. I don't know how I'm going to put that to her, but I'm convinced that they cannot do anything for her because I've I've read the medical report and I think that the outpatients will do what they can. It's just a matter of time. She is 80 and all these health issues. Um, I don't believe that there's anything more that they can do. Just give the medication and take care of her. I think that she's got too many issues, but I haven't told that to her. I would like to ask you to pray for the Lord to give her faith. I'm willing to share my faith with her, but she's turned on a soap that she's recorded, happily sitting there eating, looking at a soap at this time of night. I think I would like her to be praying to the Lord if it was me. And uh, her daughter... The next one, the, the one that's not 50, she has poor health and she does go to church. She does believe in God. What happens to people? So anyway, I'm going to share with you the Bible in one year because it will keep me focused on the Lord. And I'll just ask you to pray for her and we trust and trust her to the Lord. So today, this evening, tonight, we are on the 4th of October. It's after 11 o'clock at night, it's 10 minutes past, and um, we are in the Bible in one year, day 353. The readings will be taken from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 27, chapter 28, and I'm going to introduce you to Hebrews, because there's a lot of writing here, but it's important for us to hear it, and it will be Hebrews 1 after that. And then the Gospel of John, 15, continuing from 11 to 17. I will do one or two prayers, not many, uh, before reading. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O oh my God, I am sorry for all my sins because they offend you who are so good, and with your help I will not sin again. Angel of God, my guardian dear, to whom God's love commits me here, ever this night be at my side to light and guard, to rule and guide. Amen. Holy Michael Archangel, defend me in this day of battle. Be my safeguard against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, I humbly pray. And do thou, Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, thrust down to hell Satan and all the wicked evil spirits who wander through the world for the ruin of souls. Amen. Before reading sacred scripture, open my heart, O Holy Spirit, to receive your inspired word. Grant me wisdom to understand what you teach to teach what you want to teach me and strength of will to follow wherever you lead however i will tell you that the the national health is in a mess this is a hospital that will look after me if i'm ill but i tell you something now if i am ill i'm not going there i'll stay here and the lord can call me home from here because the treatment that people her age and the, nearly all of them were old uh, they are there for hours and hours and hours. They are assessed by a nurse and there's no doctors working because they're on strike. And when they are, they're very thin on the ground and there's not enough of them. The people are in corridors, sitting on hard seats. 
and hard places and one toilet for everybody, men and women. And they're literally there hours. And it's like a third world country. Like when I lived in Jamaica, married to a Jamaican, we had to go, not hospital for me, but for Donovan. And we were, it was exactly like that. The waiting, the time, how people were all over the place. And it, it this was no different than what I experienced in St. Anne's Bay, St. Anne's, Jamaica. It's a, a hospital for ordinary Jamaican people. Obviously, if a tourist was hurt, they'd be taken there, and then they'd be taken to um, a big hospital by helicopter or something in, in uh, Montego Bay. But this experience that uh, Rosie's related, it is terrible. She, If I'd known what she'd go through, I'd have said to her, stay home. I will in future. There's no point in going there. They're not going to treat her. They're not going to do anything. They're going to send her to the outpatient. So really, it's because they've privatised the national health and they're obviously paying for these people on 111 and the more they send, they get paid. That's what it looks like. Anyway, who knows? But I'm not going to hospital. Not that hospital. <laughs> I'll just ask the Lord, take me now. So I'm going to begin with Hebrews, or the Acts actually. So I'll do the Hebrews when it's the time. I'll just turn that over and find Acts of the Apostles. And it's going to be 27 and 28. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. Just get this out of the way. Chapter 27 and the heading is D, the journey to Rome. Chapter 27, Paul's voyage toward Rome is the heading. When it was decided that we should sail for Italy, Paul and some other prisoners were handed over to Julius, a centurion of the Augustan cohort. We embarked on a ship from Adramitium that was about to sail to ports in the province of Asia. And we put out to sea, accompanied by Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica. On the next day, we landed at Sidon, and Julius was considerate enough to allow Paul to visit his friends there and be cared for by them. From there, we put out to sea again and sailed around the sheltered side of Cyprus because of the headwinds. Then crossing the open sea off the coast of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we reached Myra in Lycia. The next heading and title, Storm and Shipwreck. There the centurion found an Alexandrian ship that was bound for Italy and put us on board. For a good many days, we made little headway and we experienced difficulty in reaching Snidus. Then as the wind continued to pose difficulties, we sailed for the sheltered side of Crete off Salmone we moved along the coast with difficulty and reached a place called Fair Havens near the city of Lassia. Much time had already been lost and sailing had now become hazardous. 
since the time of the fast had already gone by. Therefore, Paul gave them this warning. Men, I can see that this voyage will be fraught with danger and involve heavy losses, not only of the ship and the cargo, but also of our lives. However, the centurion paid more attention to the advice of the captain and of the ship's owner than to what Paul said. Since the harbour was unsuitable for spending the winter, the majority were in favour of putting out to sea from there in the hope that they could reach Phoenix, a harbour of Crete facing southwest and northwest, and spend the winter there. When a gentle southerly breeze began to blow, they thought that they would be able to achieve their objective. They weighed anchor and began to sail past Crete, hugging the shore. But before long, a violent wind, called a northeaster, swept down on them. Since the ship was caught up in it, we had to give way to the wind and let ourselves be driven along. As we passed along the sheltered side of a small island called Corda, we managed with some difficulty to secure the ship's lifeboat. After hoisting it up, they used cables to undergird the ship. Then, afraid of running aground on the shallows of Cytis, they lowered the sea anchor and so let themselves drift. We were pounded so violently by the storm that on the next day they began to throw the cargo overboard. Then on the third day, they threw the ship's gear overboard with their own hands. For many days, neither the sun nor the stars could be seen, and the storm continued to rage until we finally abandoned all hope of being saved. When they had all gone without food for a long time, Paul stood up among them and said, Men, you should have listened to me and not have set sail from Crete. Then you would have avoided all this damage and loss. I urge you now to keep up your courage. There will be no loss of life among you, only the ship will be lost. Last night, an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve appeared to me and he said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You shall appear before Caesar. Furthermore, for your sake, God has granted safety to all those who are sailing with you. Therefore, men, keep up your courage. I have complete trust in God that what he told me will be fulfilled. But we will run aground on some island. On the 14th night, we were still drifting across the Adriatic Sea. About midnight, 
the sailors began to su suspect that they were nearing land. So they took soundings and found that the water was 20 feet deep. A little further on, they again took soundings and found 15 feet. Fearing that we might run aground on the rocks, they let down four anchors from the stern and prayed for daylight to come. The sailors then tried to abandon ship. They had already lowered the lifeboat into the sea on the pretext that they were going to lower some anchors from the bow. But Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, Unless these men stay with the ship, you cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut the ropes of the lifeboat and set it adrift. Just before daybreak, Paul urged all of them to take some food, saying, This is the fourteenth day that you have been in suspense, going hungry and eating nothing. Therefore, I beg you to take some food. You need it to survive. Not one of you will lose even a hair of his head. After he had said this, he took bread, gave thanks to God in front of them all, broke it and began to eat. Then they were all encouraged and began to eat. Altogether, there were 276 persons on board. After they had eaten as much as they wanted, they lightened the ship by throwing the grain into the sea. In the morning, they did not recognise the land, but they sighted a bay with a sandy beach, and they decided to run the ship aground on this if they could. And so they cut loose the anchors and left them in the sea. At the same time, they loosened the ropes that held the rudders, then hoisting the foresail to the wind, they made for the beach, but they struck a reef and the vessel ran aground. The bow became stuck and remained unmovable while the stern was broken to pieces by the pounding of the waves. The soldiers decided to kill the prisoners, lest any of them might swim away and escape. However, the centurion was determined to spare Paul's life, and he prevented them from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and make for land, while the rest were to follow either on planks or on pieces of wreckage from the ship. In this way, all were brought safely to land. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from the Act of the Apostles, um, chapter 28. And the title, the heading, Paul at Malta. Once we had made our way to safety, we learned that the island was called Malta. The natives treated us with unusual kindness since it had begun to rain and was cold. They lit a bonfire and welcomed all of us around it. 
Paul had gathered an armful of sticks and put them on the fire. When a viper driven out by the heat attached itself to his hand. On seeing the snake hanging from his hand, the natives said to one another, This man must be a murderer. Although he escaped from the sea, justice has not allowed him to live. However, he shook off the snake into the fire and suffered no harm. They were expecting him to swell up or drop dead. And after waiting for a long time and seeing nothing unusual happen to him, they changed their minds and began to say that he was a god. If in that vicinity of that place there were lands belonging to the leading man of the island whose name was Publius, he received us and gave us his hospitality for three days. It so happened that this man's father was sick with a fever and dysentery. Paul visited him and cured him by praying and laying hands on him. After this happened, the rest of the sick people on the island also came and were cured. They honoured us with many marks of respect, and when we were about to set sail, they put on board all the supplies we needed. The next title, From Malta to Rome. Three months later, we set sail on a ship that had wintered at the island. The ship was from Alexandria, with the Dios Curi as its figurehead. We landed at Syracuse and spent three days there. Then we sailed along the coast and came to Regium. After one day, there a south wind came up and we reached Puteoli in two days. In Puteoli, we found some brethren and we were invited to stay with them for seven days. And so we came to Rome. When the brethren there learned of our arrival, they came out to meet us. As far as the forum of Apius and the three taverns. On seeing them, Paul gave thanks to God and his courage was strengthened. The next title after E. Paul's activity at Rome, it is Meetings with the Jewish Leaders. On his arrival in Rome, Paul was allowed to live by himself with a soldier guarding him. Three days later, he called together the leaders of the Jews. When they had assembled, he said to them, Brethren, although I have done nothing against our people or our ancestral customs, I was arrested in Jerusalem and handed over to the Romans. After they had examined me, the Romans wanted to release me because they found nothing against me that deserved the death penalty. But the Jews objected and I was compelled to appeal to Caesar, even though I had no accusation to make against my own nation. This is the reason I have asked to see you and speak with you, for it is because of the hope of Israel that I wear these chains. They replied, We have received no letters from Judea about you, nor have any of the brethren who arrived here 
reported or spoken anything evil about you. But we would like to hear from you what you think. For all we know about this sect is that it is denounced everywhere. And so they agreed on a day to meet with him and they came to his lodgings in great numbers. From early morning until evening he presented his case to them, testifying to the kingdom of God and attempting to convince them about Jesus as he argued from both the law of Moses and the prophets. Some were persuaded by what he had said, but others refused to believe. Having failed to reach an agreement among themselves, they began to leave. Then Paul made his final statement. How right the Holy Spirit was when he spoke to your ancestors through the prophet Isaiah, saying, Go to the people and say you will indeed listen, but never understand. And you will indeed look, but never perceive. For this people's heart has become dull. Their ears have been stopped up. And they have shut their eyes, lest their eyes might see. Their ears might hear, and their hearts might understand. Then they would be converted, and I would heal them. Therefore let it be known to you that this salvation offered by God has been sent to the Gentiles and they will listen. And when he said this, the Jews departed arguing vigorously among themselves. The conclusion, but not an end. Paul remained there in his lodgings for two full years at his own expense, he welcomed all who came to him and without hindrance, he boldly proclaimed the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a lot of notes to Acts, but my eyes are not good enough to read it. So I'm going to switch over now to the Hebrews. It's good, but I'm going to try and read the front of the Hebrews, the introduction and telling you about Hebrews. And it's Hebrews 1 that I shall be reading. So I'm going to turn back. Or is it forward? I've got, I think it's forward, you know. <laughs> no, it's forward. Yes. I'm going to begin with the letter to the Hebrews which is not in a very big, it's not in a big font, but chapter one is slightly bigger, but this is in italic, so I'll, I'll be reading it very slowly, I think, but I will read it, it's important. And the heading is, after the letter to the Hebrews, Christ, the one true priest. A tradition going back at least to the end of the second century, describes this important writing as the letter of St. Paul to the Hebrews. But the correctness of these data, genre of the work, author, addresses, is challenged by critics nowadays. Is it a letter? Only the last section is in the epistolary style. At the beginning, there is no greeting to the readers, nor is there subsequently any direct dialogue with a community, nor are there any references to concrete events. The pages seem rather to be a sermon throughout. Is it by Paul? At more than one point, the thought may recall 
that of the apostle. But the tone, the choice of main themes, the atmosphere and the manner of arguing force us to look for a different author. The author is certainly of Jewish origin since he is completely at home with the Bible. In addition, he has quite a gift of eloquence. His faith is complete and deep. He is highly educated. He is devoted to teaching and familiar also with the work of Philo, a famous philosopher of Alexandria. Among the various possible authors that fit this picture, the favourite is Apollos, of whom Luke speaks admiringly in the Acts of the Apostles, 18, 24 to 28. But this is, and will always remain, simply a guess. As for the addresses, these Jews, the author is seeking to revive the faith and courage of converts of long standing, who in all probability were of Jewish origin. In debating with them, the author continually cites the scriptures and ceaselessly recalls the most important ideas and realities of the Jewish religion. These individuals know Jewish tradition, its great personages, its worship and its law. Persecution has dispersed them and they live in poverty, uprooted and excluded from their former religious activities. The modest and youthful Church of Christ crucified does not seem to them to bear comparison with Judaism which benefits from a long and often glorious past and the splendour of its worship. In response, the letter begins by emphasising the grandeur of the mystery of Christ's death and resurrection for all human beings. It stresses the superiority of Christ who is the express image of God, superior to Moses, to Aaron, to the angels, and to any other thing, a brother to humans and a sharer in their misery and anguish. He is also the Son of God. Believers must not look with nostalgia to the past, but press on toward heaven, where the human condition will find its fulfilment in eternity. Secondly, the author states, excuse me a moment, sorry. The author states that the old dispensation has gone and a new dispensation is here, the new covenant. Now people can come to Christ wherever they are, not by way of Jerusalem, except in a figurative way, through the heavenly Jerusalem. Thirdly, the author highlights the glorious priesthood of Christ in contrast to the superseded 
priesthood of Jerusalem. Jesus is now at God's right hand, pleading for us eternally. Since he knows what it is like to be human, he can plead with full understanding. Hence, we can go to the throne of grace with full confidence of being heard. The author emphasises the need for perseverance. His addresses must not quit and fall like their ancestors in the wilderness and such a sorrowful event will never take place if they stand fast and do not become discouraged. To help them stand fast, the author sets before them the glories of faith and a series of personages who have possessed it, abundance in abundance. He preaches a wonderful sermon on those who used faith in God to endure even the greatest of trials. Along the way, the author insists on the internal dynamism of God's revelation. It has only one goal, the redemption of the world in Christ. It is a movement toward a fullness and an accomplishment. And the scriptures are what enable people to be gripped by its power and its teaching. The realities of the Old Testament are there like a sketch, figure or shadow of a greater reality. They are of the terrestrial order in order to announce a heavenly and eternal order. The unique supremacy of the work of Christ, the biblical meditation is developed and deepened in order to better express the mystery of Christ. Hence this letter introduces us to the Christian reading of the Old Testament. It utilizes some 33 citations from the Old Testament as well as 53 reminiscences or allusions. All the citations are attributed to God himself, most often introduced by the anonymous formula, he said. The author then passes from theological reflection to moral exhortation. The appeals are multiplied. Live in faith and hope for the things to come and in constancy amid trials. As far as the date in which this letter was written, it was certainly completed by the year 90. Since it is cited by Clement of Rome, one is tempted to situate it at around 67, just before the destruction of the temple. For the cessation of the worship of Jerusalem would certainly have been echoed in this writing that speaks so much about sacrifices and sanctuaries. Yet, a reading gives the impression that these, sacrifice, these realities are still functioning. However, such a reasoning is not decisive, for in speaking of the temple, the author hardly describes what is taking place in the ostentation sanctuary built by Herod. He is more acquainted with this ideal images set forth in the Pentateuch concerning the tabernacle of the desert at the time of Hebrews. And the letter of the Hebrews may be divided as follows. 1. Prologue 1. 1 to 4 2. The Son of God Superior to the angels, 1, 5, 2, 18. 3, a high priest for humanity, 3, 1 to 5 and 10. 4, Christ the one true priest, 
5, 11 to 10, 18. 5, sorry, that was 4. 5 is now. Perseverance in faith, 10, 19, 12, 29. And 6, conclusion, 1, 3, 1, 25. Now I'm beginning to read the first chapter of Hebrews chapter 1 and the title is Prologue. So it is only Hebrews I have to read 1 and then John 15, 11 to 17. So I'm going to begin now. In previous times... God spoke to our ancestors in many and various ways through the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us through his Son, whom he, he appointed heir of all things and through whom he created the universe. He is the reflection of God's glory and the perfect expression of his very being, sustaining all things by his powerful word, achieving purification from sins. He took his seat at the right hand of the majesty on high, so he became as far superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. The next title is two, the Son of God, in superior to the angels, messianic enthronement. For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, this day I have begotten you? Or again, I will be his father, and he will be my son? And again, when he brings his firstborn into the world, he says, let all the angels of God pay him homage. Of the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds and his servants flames of fire. But of the sun, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. And a righteous scepter is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and detested wickedness. Therefore God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness far above your companions. He also says, In the beginning, O Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will roll them up like a cloak. Like a garment they will be changed. But you are ever the same. And your years will have no end. But to which of the angels has he ever said? Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Are not all angels ministering spirits sent forth to serve for the sake of those who will inherit salvation? The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Chapter 15. The reading is from 11, 11 to 17. And the heading after the 11 says... I have told you these things so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. 
and the heading and title, Love as Jesus Does. This is my commandment, love one another as I have loved you. No one can have greater love than to lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends. If you do what I command you, I shall no longer call you servants, because a servant does not know what his master is doing. I have called you friends, because I have revealed to you everything that I have heard from my father. You did not choose me. Rather, I chose you, and I appointed you to go out and bear fruit, fruit that will remain, so that the Father may give you whatever you ask him in my name. The command I give you is this. Love one another. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you so much for listening. I feel much better now I've read scripture. I wish everybody who didn't know God would read the Bible, hear the Bible, hear his word. I just wish people would throw their televisions out, especially when they're old, and try, try to see if they can connect in their spirit. They have a spirit. Connect with the Holy Spirit and find Jesus before it's too late. It saddens me, especially when I know the person has a kind heart and a generous spirit and has done their best and had many hardships and just interested in modern technology, televisions and televisions, I call them, and soap operas that just show sin. Oh, imagine wanting to come home from hospital and all you want to watch is people sin on the heat television. Oh, please pray for my friend to find Jesus. Friend and neighbour. After reading sacred scripture, I thank you, Holy Spirit, for the word you've spoken to me through the treasure of the scripture. Make these words a living reality in my life, a constant guide, a lamp for my feet, and a light to my path. Amen. Come Holy Spirit, guide us, work in us with your gifts, so that your presence may be shown and we may serve in different ways. Come Holy Spirit and help us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we should. Intercede for us, so that the one who sees into our hearts and knows our thoughts may hear our prayers. God bless you all, and may the Lord heal you, and be with you, and speak to you, and open up your heart to him. And I will see, O joyful light of the holy glory of the immortal Father, Heavenly, holy, blessed Jesus Christ, now that we have come to the sun's hour of rest, the lights of evening round us shine. We praise the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God. Worthy are you, O Lord, at all times to be praised with undefiled tongue. O Son of God, O giver of life, Therefore you are glorified throughout the universe. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Philippians 4.13 Reading from Psalm 137 I thank you, Lord, with all my heart. You have heard the words of my mouth. In the presence of the angels I will bless you. I will adore before your holy temple. I thank you for your faithfulness and love which excel all we ever knew of you. On the day I called, you answered. You increased the strength of my soul. All the rulers on earth shall thank you when they hear the words of your mouth. 
They shall sing of the Lord's ways. How great is the glory of the Lord. The Lord is high, yet he looks on the lowly, and the haughty he knows from afar. Though I walk in the midst of affliction, you give me life and frustrate my foes. You stretch out your hands and save me. Your hand will do all things for me. Your love, O Lord, is eternal. Discard not the work of your hands. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Do you not know? A reading from 1 Corinthians 9 two. Do you not know that in a race the runners all compete, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win it. Word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Canticle of Mary, which is Magnificat, Luke one forty six to 55 and St. Bede said, Mary had every right to rejoice in Jesus, for in one and the same person he would truly be her son and saviour. My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my saviour, for he has looked with favour on his lowly servant, and from this day all generations will call me blessed. The Almighty has done great things for me. Holy is his name. He has mercy on those who fear him in every generation. He has shown the strength of his arm. He has scattered the proud in their conceit. He has cast down the mighty from their thrones and has lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and has sent the rich away empty. He has come to the help of his servant Israel, for he has remembered his promise of mercy, the promise he made to our fathers, to Abraham and his children forever. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Invocations. Lord, remember all who live the Christian life. Show them the light of your face. Uphold all who serve you in the ministry. Give them the strength of your Holy Spirit. Fill the hearts of your people with joy and peace. Answer all their needs. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. The concluding prayer. It is for you that we live, Lord our God, and to you we have consecrated this day. Perfect and purify our offering, so that our prayer of thanksgiving may rise to you. In Jesus, your Son, our Lord. Amen. And the blessing. May God light the fire of his love in our hearts. Amen. May the souls of the faithful departed through the mercy of God rest in peace. Amen. And may St. Francis of Assisi pray for us. Amen. God bless you all. Have a wonderful night if you're at night and afternoon if you're in the afternoon and a marvellous day if it's morning. Thank you so much for your comments, for sharing and being there. I do appreciate it. Thank you so much. God bless and good night. It's two minutes after midnight, so it'll be tomorrow's date now, which it still says 05, but in a second or two it should be... Oh, yes, of course it is 05, isn't it? I began on 04. <laughs> God bless. <laughs>